Hello, hello, hello. Hello, how are you today? Looking to get started in genealogy? This is what you need to do. First, you should watch my very first episode called Online Genealogy. That's where I show my little cousin how to research his family. Then you wanna think about the awesome journey that you are about to embark on because you hear the call. You desire to know who you are. Is there any truth to the stories passed down from generation to generation? Finally, you want to subscribe to our YouTube channel, follow us on Facebook, subscribe to our newsletter. This is the best way to know when there's new episodes. Also, this is the best way to stay on top of getting your research done, right? You want to do this. Find your people, find other people's people because it's so interesting. So chop, chop, let's do this. Each month, Genealogy Quick Start provides you with four quick starts. Think about how do they apply to your research? Try it out. I found that learning is not a spectator sport. You have to roll up your sleeves and get out there and do it. You want to find your people. So look, you have to look, try it, take it and apply it. So how are you doing today? Welcome to Genealogy Quick Start. I'm Shamel and I'm your genealogy coach to get you out there and do what you want to do. You can watch Genealogy Quick Start on YouTube, Facebook, and Philly Cam. This is a Philly Cam Studios produced show out of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. It's so nice to have you here. Um, please announce who you are and where you are. And also, if you're a member of a genealogy group, we really need to know that because everybody needs to be a member of a genealogy group. So what do we have going on today? Um, we have a very special guest, um, Colleen Robledo Green, and she's going to do a quick start on dissecting an immigrant story. Immigrant story, very key to the American experience for most of us, right? Um, and then my buddy Jim is here. Michael is on vacation this week, um, and he's going to talk about etchings not so eternal. And I have some books and Jim has some books that we're going to talk about um, that deal with cemeteries and cemetery research. So without further ado, let me bring my buddy on here, Jim Beidler, editor and columnist. How are you doing today, Jim? I am well, Shamel. And how about you? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. So you're doing a talk on cemeteries today. And so I thought it would be good if we brought out some of our cemetery books. And bring out the big guns. Absolutely. Bring out the big guns. So there's yep. so many different ones. And I'll share with you some that I really like. Um, one is called Grave Intentions, a comprehensive guide to preserving historic cemeteries. And this is one specific to Georgia, but it is a very nice, comprehensive book. Um, another is one, I don't know, it feels when I look at this and I feel this book, it feels like I picked this up like in Barnes and Noble or Borders or something, but it's a very nice book. It's called Stories in Stone, a field guide in cemetery symbolism and icon um, iconography. <laughs> <laughs> and this one is specific to one location, but you can find this anywhere. And, you know, for your locations, the Images of America collection. And this one is specific to Philadelphia graveyards and cemeteries. And speaking of Philadelphia cemeteries, they have this cute one that has all of these really funny sayings. I guess you get this when you visit uh, Laurel Hill Cemetery. How not to die be a visitor at Laurel Hill Cemetery, not a resident. So that's <laughs> a book. <that. laughs> I like that. And this one is one that is an oldie. Um, I'm pretty sure there might be more out there, but it's called Lay Down Body. 
And it's about um, living history of African-American cemeteries. And there are cemeteries all um, throughout the country. And Jim has one as well for the bookshelf. What do you have, Jim? Yeah, I'll, I'll see you all those and I'll raise you <laughs> for uh, the Family Tree Cemetery Field Guide Finding Find, Record, and Preserve by Joy Neighbors. Uh, this, this is an excellent book. Uh, that you know goes over everything from uh, uh, you know the type of things we're doing today, emphasizing getting inscriptions and looking looking for them, and uh, you know finding all about everything. It's a really uh, really good thing. But yeah, I you know I don't think there's any genealogist that doesn't like cemeteries. I haven't. If there is one, oh I haven't. God. I haven't <laughs> seen that person yet. So, so I'd uh, like to introduce you. Let's see if she's here. I'd like to introduce you. Let's see who's here. Okay. She's not here yet, but yeah. I actually met someone, a genealogist who's actually afraid of cemeteries. Well, I'm getting them kicked out of the club. So. <laughs> no, You're going to take their genealogy card? Yeah. From them? <laughs> yeah because cause let's, let's face it, before, especially before photography, that memorial marker is kind of the representation of them that uh, that you get uh, and uh, you know things that aren't particularly germane to our talk today but you know the the style and the the exact verbiage that's on the stone you know sometimes can even give you some insights into character that's so true let me see who's here we have gary from toledo has claimed his number one spot hello gary hey dean henry from philly aagg representing if you're in the philly area new jersey you know you don't need a passport to go over there delaware check them out hello. yo dean <laughs> yeah dean hey wayne and gracie Ann, right down the road in magnolia Hello, Wanda Looney in Birmingham at the uh, Birmingham African American Genealogy Group. I want to hang out with you guys, Wanda. I need to actually talk to you, I think. Hello, Denise Payne from the Netherlands and June Hall from Shaker Heights. You, she said that because she knew I, I could not end the show without saying Shaker Heights. So hello, June from AAG. S, um, the African American Genealogy Society, right there in Cleveland. So, if you haven't said where you're from, please do so um, in the chat and include your group. So, Jim, are you ready to get started with what's this cool? Are you are you going to be able to handle it by yourself? Well, it's going to be difficult, but uh, you know, we're, we're just going to have to uh, impute that Michael is here <laughs> giving his quips and so forth. So today's quick start is etchings not so eternal. So what does that even mean? Jim? Well, as 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 with many of our quick starts, and this is Michael's involvement in today, even though he's not here, a lot of a lot of times I go to his genealogy tips of the day book and just kind of open at random, and a lot of times I will find a tip. Uh, that uh, that seems like it could make a good quick start. And in this case, he was he was t lamenting the fact that he did not get photographs of a lot of the tombstones uh, of his ancestors earlier. And now they're either difficult to read or they're not uh, they're not even there anymore. You know, time time does. Uh, is a factor on these things. So Yes, most definitely. And I didn't really think about that until uh, Rick Sayer actually did a talk <laughs> where he had an ancestor where the the letters were like bare, like they were like a in, two inches deep within into the stone. What you got? Is somebody about to attack you? Do I have to come to PA? And I, I thought I thought I might have heard my door, but I'm going to assume assume it's not. So all right, <laughs> lock and load. <laughs> All right, let's go to step one, um, which is to determine the burial location. So um, you have an ancestor that you, you know, you're trying to find out where they are. Um, you have this beautiful burial location that I'll share as soon as I can get my fingers to work. <laughs> <laughs> let's see. There we are. Um, almost. Okay. Where are we here in this burial location? Oh, almost. There we go. 
this is Christ Lutheran Church in Stouchburg, Marion Township, Berks County. Uh, and it's one of the earliest uh, churches in the Tulpahocken region. Oh, uh, and uh, that's a Topahawken Creek. Oh, uh, and uh, a lot of early Germans. Oh, imagine that, right? Oh, uh, <laughs> and and so oh, um, uh, it has it uh, it has records that uh, go back to the 1740s, close to its founding. Oh, uh, and it has a, a very active old graveyard. Uh, active from the standpoint that a lot of the tombs, the tombstones are are still around. So, so you just said something that just really took me back to an experience that I had in a cemetery that brought me to tears. Like I seriously thought that um, somebody was going to have to call the police and take my hands from off this woman's neck who worked at the cemetery because. She would not let me see any records. Ah. So you said that you were able to see records. So how do you like the somebody was about to let me see the records and then someone came out of an office and said, oh, no, she's not allowed to look at that. So what <coughs> have you encountered that? Oh, uh, yeah, I've encountered variants of that in, in the in the largest Garden Cemetery of Lebanon County. Oh, uh, they. So, hey, I I do literally have a knock at my door. Yeah, I, I'm going to oh, ask okay, you to ad lib for okay, just a second, no, and I'll gonna, be no, right go back. Ahead, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so, guys, do have any of you guys had that happen to you? Um, you know, you find your burial location, which they're saying determine your burial location. You find it, and they won't allow you to see any records have, has that happened to anyone? Like, what do you do? Um, I was told that, you know, it was because the records were private or if I wanted to see the records that I needed to have whoever the person was who, um, Jim, that's really funny. I had to have whatever the person was who paid for the headstones, who's no longer living, I had to get their written permission. Oh, jeez, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and what the what the story I was trying to tell is uh, at uh, Mount Lebanon. Oh, uh, I I was researching the Dobb family as I frequently frequently do, and so I they had like fifteen cards on the the Dobbs. So I was looking looking at those, and uh, the woman was kind of doing shuffling in behind, and then she comes back and says, uh, "Well, that uh, Elizabeth Dobb, uh, are you a relative?" And I said, "No, why? Uh, well, uh, the perpetual care dues are are due." <laughs> and, and I'm like, yeah, I'm not, I'm not a close relative. And she says, yeah, that's what they always say. <laughs> yeah. She sounds like she was running a scam. <laughs> probably, probably. <laughs> oh, that's a good one. All right. So are there other, like, if you really don't know, like, what are ways to determine the burial location? Yeah. Well, you, you, you want to start with obviously trying to find out where were they living when, when they died, uh, you know, through, through census, through tax records, through any sort of residential record. Oh, uh, and then, you know, look for newspaper obituaries, look for church burial rec records uh, in that area uh, that, that may then pinpoint it to a cemetery. And all of these are different records. For instance, the church burial register, generally what that's showing is uh, the burials that were performed by the ministers of the congregation. They might have been buried in a different cemetery. Mm. You know, so, so, and a lot of times they'll note that in the burial record, uh, but it's not, in other words, it's not one-to-one -one correspondence that if it's in a particular uh, church's burial register, that it's also going to be on their particular graveyard. Okay. Okay. So you ready to go on to step two, you determine the burial location yes. and yep. then you want to search online for the headstone. So where, where are you going to do that? Well, I mean, the number one is find a grave. You yeah. know, there's also billion graves. There's also some others, but uh, find a find a grave is kind of the uh, the first stop now. Uh, and I had a particular ancestor that uh, I was interested in, uh, named Jacob Winter. 
Oh, I mean, he would have pronounced it winter, but uh, winter, we, we okay. would we would call it winter today. Oh, uh, and uh, he is buried at that uh, Christ uh, Lutheran Cemetery uh, in the in the old graveyard. Oh, uh, and lived a long life. He was born 1763. His baptism, as a matter of fact, is in the the Christ Lutheran Register also. Oh, nice. uh, and he died uh, died 1841. Oh, uh, and this so uh, this find a grave. Now I'm not sure when the find a grave memorial itself was created, but the photo w was taken 2010. Okay. That's important. To remember that. Oh, uh, but uh, <laughs> but yeah. Fun. So so that find a grave memorial that uh, that is that is helpful. Oh, uh, but we want to try to do our own field work. Oh, mm -hmm. uh, and and part of part of that. Uh, is also seeing, I mean, in this case, you know, he had an intact tombstone. Uh, but, you know, sometimes you want to go back and look at collections of cemetery inscriptions. Uh, and I think that's our, our next slide. Three, yeah, I think. Three, okay. Which oh. is the transcribe the headstone. So I wanted to, before you move on, yes, I wanted to sure. hear from everyone, like, Billion Graves. So we didn't talk about find a grave was like the first one, but Billion Graves is really cool because we can easily be a part of that and it's attached to GPS. There's like it's a GPS um, application. Mm -hmm. So um, do you like Billion Graves? Do you use Billion Graves or there's some pros and cons between the two? I, I really don't use it. Yeah, oh, okay. I know. I know, okay. I know it exists. Yeah. Does anybody out there do any of the Anyone um, watching? Do any of you guys use Billion Graves? So let me know when you think about it. Let me know. I really like Billion Graves. I think it's cool for young people because it's an app that they can get involved and take pictures of cemetery headstones. All right. So let's move on to step three, which is to transcribe the headstone. So what were you saying? You said that uh, that this is a good way to find out more. Well, cer certainly you want to transcribe word for word, but also you want to look at collections uh, of that were made of the uh, the tombstone uh, inscriptions, because uh, so sometimes you'll find ones for stones that no longer are there. Uh, other times you'll you'll find in the case of uh, in case of Jacob's stone. Oh, uh, and he's he's number one on this page on the left hand <laughs> left hand uh, side. Uh, there, all they did was just transcribe the name, the dates, uh, and the age check. Oh, uh, and and that's that's not that's not kind of the state of the art as far as what you should be doing. You should be trying to, to trade. You should be trying to. Uh, uh, get the whole inscription and get it line by line, uh, so that you know what was there. Because again, the 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 whole deal, the whole nut of this thing is it might not always be there. Yeah. Uh, and and so uh, so you want to uh, uh, you want to preserve the status of things right now, uh, and then write it down for the future. You know, just in case it does become illegible. Or the the stone does break and and disappear because uh, that Ooh, that happens a lot. not infrequently. Yes, a yep. lot because uh, my great grandmother's headstone was like hanging on by a thread when I was mm. there, and you know what I did? I took pictures of the entire cemetery. I just spent some hours, and it doesn't take long. Snap, move, snap, move, mm -hmm. and I just took a picture of every head, and it was just a church cemetery, so you know they're not going to have like um, uh, big websites with uh, where you can go and see this stuff or even right. records necessarily all the time. And um, yeah, transcribe those headstones because you don't know when they're going to go away. So you want to go on now to step four? Sure. So step four is to locate the headstone and those nearby. I love that. So you located the headstone and you made it better. Let's take a look. Yeah, because the, 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 the photo on the left there is how the stone had degraded 
by 2015. Remember, in 2010, you got a pretty legible inscription. Oh, uh, and so I I used uh, the D2 cleaner on the stone, just sprayed it on and let let the uh, rain and snowfall do its work. Oh, uh, and if you and my my photo on the right is a little too bright, but it it definitely did improve the uh, the readability uh, and if I would have had better better light on it I think I got it back to uh, what it was like in in 2010 uh, and so this this is uh, you know my my thing that I did for old Jake so let's talk about this because um, you know we don't want to do damage so I've heard people do rubbings right that's bad that's no don't do that right Oh, uh, that's the current, that's the current thought, you know, who knows five years from now, we, we may have an, <laughs> another study that, that, you know, for, you know, just like for a long time with archival documents, they wanted us all to, to put on gloves. And now the, the current vogue I understand is uh, no, no gloves because glove, gloves only offered uh, a false sense of security uh, and that people are damaging documents more with the gloves on than they were Ooh. with clean hands. Okay. You know, so, you know, so, so I, I don't, I mean, you know, no wire brushes. Absolutely. Okay. No wire brushes. Yeah, like, yeah, no that, wire hangers. Yeah. Ginger yeah. guys with the wire yeah. brush. And yeah. a mommy dearest hairdo. No, d d um, <laughs> <laughs> D two is all I would use, and and I do not, I do, I do not, unless it's unless it's a stone that I'm going to be very very careful with. I don't even use it, you know, in, in a rubbing way. I just spray it on, spray it on, and let it work. Oh, uh, and we've had marvelous results at the the uh, uh, cemetery and graveyard that I'm on a trustee uh, of uh, with, uh, you know, nature working after you do the initial application. Okay. Uh, so like that, that, yep, that's, yeah, yeah. You just spray it, spray it and forget it. That's, uh, that's what so we, Kathy what we said do. that she's worked, they're working on her uh, original grandparents headstone. What a mess. What's a mess. What's going on over there, Kathy? What are you guys doing? Did you didn't do the spray to D two and let nature do its job? <laughs> Tell us well, what's a mess. <laughs> well, well, we'll give her a chance to respond. So yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, yeah. I, I, oh, uh, you know, everything has has its place. But oh, uh, and D two, what it especially works on is you know things like moss and you know anything biological it basically starves the biological stuff so it stops mm -hmm. using the it stops using the marvel the marble uh as lunch uh for for itself <laughs> so, that's a nice way to put it yeah, well that i i i it's not original but ted the guy who invented d2 <laughs> i i got a chance to meet him at fgs oh, pittsburgh cool. a few years ago and and he you know he 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 explained it to me so but um yeah so that's that's the uh oh okay kathy's saying someone had used shaving cream and melted the stone yeah, oh my yeah. gosh! Yeah, shaving shaving cream was in vogue for a hot minute, and <laughs> and and unfortunately, too many people just did it without without uh, checking things out. But uh, yeah, it, you know, some things some things you're you're not going to be able to repair, and then all the better that uh, you consult any older. Uh, inscriptions that have the full inscription, you know, all the more reason uh, to see if there are photos out there that were taken prior to said mess. Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. No shaving cream. Say no yeah. to shaving cream. It doesn't even make sense. It's just like, yeah. why? Yeah. But Don't that was, that. and I, it's probably 20 years ago now, but that was, oh my goodness, people were, oh, look at all of this. It fills in the, oh. oh. <laughs> Oh my gosh. So let's talk about the yeah. nearby aspect. I love this um, that you and Michael came up with about yeah. locate the, you know, what does this mean about the nearby? Why do you need well, that? Well, and, 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 and Michael's point when we were, were talking about this is a, a, a con on uh, find a grave is that they generally are not put in the context of the rows or plots that that they appear in the original cemetery, which again 
inscriptions, most usually inscriptions that have been done, you know, like by a local society or whatever, they will, they'll have a map of the, of yes. the cemetery and then they'll, they'll show you what their, uh, what their methodology was. Uh, the closest that find a grave does have is you'll see at the bottom here, lists of family members. Uh, now they're not necessarily at the same cemetery, uh, but, um, but if you're if you're out there in the field in the cemetery, yeah, definitely walk around, see who the who your ancestor is next to, oh, uh, and you know you 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 may come up with some uh, some unexpected uh, relatives in the in the process. Uh, I mean, my my very my entree into genealogy basically was I was was helping do a 250th anniversary history book and only lived a mile from the church. And I told my mom, I'm going to go down to the old graveyard to see if there's anything else I can find. And I never came back from that graveyard. Because uh, <laughs> I, I immediately found new ancestors just from the old German German tombstones. So, oh, that's so uh, cool. And, and that context was key because because I found, I found three generations of the Kirchner family of uh, my ancestors all within a few rows of each other. Sorry, I meant to solo you. That's okay. <laughs> yeah, sure. That's what she says. <laughs> all right, let's move on to, um, I love the nearby aspect because yeah. that's really like the whole fan club cluster mm -hmm. genealogy mm -hmm. um, aspect in the cemetery. Yep. Now, now it, and it, now it all, it all depends, you know, again, a lot of these old graveyards, uh, my understanding is they they buried as people died and the first spouse to die they would they would keep a grave open for the spouse and then they would just keep burying you know so so a lot of times you can uh you can see the chronology of how that graveyard grew uh you know over over time because they might have had five rows that were active at a time you know, going back and forth. And, and that's something good to know. That's like a whole yes. other level yep. of understanding yep. that can really answer some questions for you while you're in the cemetery. Yep. I love well, that chronology. Mm -hmm. Yep. Cause at, cause at that, at that uh, graveyard I've been talking about, there's actually a wooden tombstone, a wooden memorial mm -hmm. uh, that we believe is of a civil war soldier. And we're trying to identify because of course the inscription, if, it, if there ever really was an inscription is long gone. Uh, and so we're trying to work at, okay, where is that in the chronology mm -hmm. to then look at other records from that time period? So key, so key. And let's move on to, let's see, Nadine cleans veteran headstones. Very nice. Nadine, do you use D2? Um, she says it's very important to see how these stones are laid out. Yep. Yes. Yep. Yes, Definitely yes, find yes. extra people. Oh, grandpops was broken in a pile at the end and put it back together. Oh, you're going to put it into a frame. Yes, that happens. That happens. <laughs> Let's move on to step five, which is to then to evaluate the information. So have you found anything um, interesting on a headstone that, you know, you didn't expect to find? Well, I found I found ones that uh, that I believe are, are 10 years off. Oh, uh, wow. yeah. I, I mean, where the where the month and day are correct, but I'm virtually sure that. Uh, the woman was born 1734, not 1744, as her tombstone says. Uh, you know, you know, it, yeah, it, interesting things like that. Birth. Yeah, the birth yeah. is kind of kind of iffy, right? <laughs> it's like census birth years. Um, yeah. So thank you. Let's look at the quick start for etchings not so eternal. Uh, step one is to determine the burial location. Step two is to search online for the headstone. I, I got to get a new assistant. The, look at two words are spelled wrong here. Step three, transcribe the headstone. Step four is to locate the headstone and those nearby. Step five is then to evaluate the information. And so hopefully you got some really good information from doing some, uh, let's see what we, what did, let me see quickly about what we said about billion graves is everyone says so far that they both use them both. 
Um, more information on Find a Grave. Yep, because it's older. So yeah, check out Billion Graves and Find a Graves. It's kind of like your at-home cemetery walk, um, if you can get into it. Jim, thank you so much for that. Welcome, Schmel. We'll see you at the end for the question of the day. All right. Did you guys enjoy that? Etchings not so eternal. Cemeteries are fascinating. Um, are you a genealogist that does not like cemeteries? I'd like to hear from you. We really want to hear from you because we're going to start a support group. And I have a person who's going to help you out. All right. Let's get ready for our second quick start. All right, let me bring on our extra special guest today. Far away on the West Coast, we have Colleen Robledo Green. How are you, Colleen? Hi, Shamil. I'm great. How are you? I'm fantastic. It is very nice to have you here today. I just realized we're kind of we're color coordinated. We are. We're both we in our reds. <laughs> our power color. <laughs> I love that. I love that. So, Colleen, we always want to know what our special guest one minute genealogy story is, how you got started and how you knew you were hooked. OK, well, um, I started as a local historian um, you know, through my academic studies and was researching other people's families uh, and didn't really think about mine because who's going to write, you know, where my family didn't you know, accomplish big things in history, or so we think, the way that we're taught history in schools. Um, but my grandpa and I were very close, my grandpa Flanagan, and uh, my mom's father, uh, second, uh, those grandparents were second parents to me. And he'd been double orphaned by the time he was three years old, and um, did not even know the name of his parents until he was an adult and spent his entire life trying to get answers and reconnect with family. And I did not take this interest when he was still living mm. to help him. Uh, and it was the year he died. Uh, he died in 1997. And I knew he had been in an orphanage and was raised in Buffalo, New York area. And uh, when the 1930 census, I found him. Uh, living with four brothers in an orphanage. And that was, yeah. it just hasn't stopped since. Wow. And I called, I called my mom about one o'clock in the morning uh, <laughs> to wake her up and tell her what I found. So. I love that. So the 1930 <laughs> census was pivotal for you. It was pivotal. It, it, it identified him. It gave me the orphanage name. And I was able to make phone calls and obtain those orphan records, which, you know, helped me put me on the path of discovering his part of my family history. Oh, I love that. So it was pivotal for me too. We should have like a club where 19, like this census decade made a difference in your life. So yeah, thank you for definitely. sharing that. If anybody sure. out there, the 1930 census, when they came out, like if, <clears throat> if that started you on your path, I want to know about that. Email me because you have something in common with me and Colleen. <laughs> So let's get started with our quick start. You have so much to show. I don't want to waste a second. <laughs> Not that it's a sec waste talking about whatever we're talking about. Sure. So we're talking today. Our quick start is dissecting an immigrant story. So let's move quickly to step one, which is what do you want to know? Yes. So let's share. What did you want to know, Colleen? <laughs> hey, well, this is from the Mexican half of my family history. I, I like to describe myself as a Latina leprechaun. Um, <laughs> and this is the Mexican half of my family history, which I started researching a little bit later than uh, my Irish side. And this was that very first document I got. So I, I told you the story of 1997, what got me interested. And then I started wanting to get answers about my Mexican family history. And all anyone who was left alive in my very large family knew is we were from San Luis Potosí, Mexico. Um, so my great aunt, we always have that great aunt, right? Who's the, uh -huh. keeper, the keeper of the records. Yeah. Um, she sent me this clipping. Okay. Um, it's a 1963 obituary for who my family calls little grandma, my second great grandma. 
my dad knew her. She died before I was born. But we all get this obituary. And obituaries, I love obituaries. They're, they can be so packed with genealogical information. Yes, yes. And additional clues. Sometimes the info's correct. <laughs> sometimes it's not. But it, you know, it sets us on this big uh, mystery, mysteries to solve. So what do we want to know? I actually, I do two lectures that really dissect this and teach the genealogical proof standard. We're going to focus on one question here because that headline, I don't know if you saw it. My family's very proud of this. 105. Says she lived to be 105 years old and had 21 children, but we only have time for one question. So what do we want to know? You have to go through a document like this and identify the specific questions you want to answer. So today we're going to tackle how old was she? Did she really live to be 105 as well as where she was born? Um, so we need, we need to assess that information, pick out those questions. So we're going to go answer that question or investigate it. Okay. I want you to show, I want you to show this too. We had um, yes. a, a, something of her as well. I love this picture. Normally it's your yes. backdrop. It is. I use this frequently as my, one of my Zoom backgrounds, particularly when I'm uh, teaching and speaking about Mexican and Hispanic uh, family history. Um, this is the house that Aurelia, my, my second great grandma, little grandma, um, this is where she lived after she married my second great grandfather. Um, this was uh, it's a it's a home, our family home still in our small, tiny, tiny rural rancho in central Mexico. And this was the Hacienda. Um, the Hacienda system was abolished in Mexico with the revolution in the early 1900s. Um, but this was referred to as Hacienda Temescal. And my family were the Hacendados. Um, they, they were the the big family. It was the big house. Uh, <laughs> but this is this is uh, the home of Aurelia's husband's parents. Okay. Okay. She moved there when she got married, and that's where they had and raised all of their children. Okay. And and my dad and I visited there in 2017. Oh, that's so nice. That's so nice. So you wanted to know, like, one of your question, one of your many questions is, you know about her birth is she was she really yeah. 105 exactly so step one was step to one get was... that question and you know you got to start with a question have to form and, the research question and step two is you want to start in the u.s the first thing we do is we just like we're out of here oh yeah like, we want to oh, we want to just jump right back <laughs> to that old country um but we know accurate genealogy involves working from the present to the past so we don't, to make sure we're accurate and we don't miss key clues. Um, and with her, all that obituary said was 105 and born in Mexico. It said her, her family had had a ranch in San Luis Potosí, a, a state. But we have to find out a little more information than that um, to be able to look for records. And so we need to look, we need to consider what kind of records in an individual's life or among their other family might answer this question. And the obituary gave us some info. Um, U.S. Census is not super helpful because they generally only state the country of birth, not locality. Same with U.S. vital records. Um, this is Aurelia's death certificate. Now, she married in Mexico. We could look at a marriage record if she married here. But this is typical of U.S. vital records in the contemporary Mexico. era. All it states is Mexico. And it gives us the same, if we infer, it gives us the same age. Yeah, she's it, 105. It, case yes, closed. So Why she's 105. Um, obituary right? gave us uh, an age, but not a birth date. So here we have a new piece of information, a birth yes. date. But, you know, we... We know as you start working and, and growing in your methodology that often the death certificate and the headstone and obituary, all the information comes from the same person. Oh, my yeah. goodness, Colleen, are you saying this isn't case closed? You mean I still It's have not case closed. Oh and the, the informant on this record was her youngest living son. So oh. did he, if you ask my brother questions about my mom's birth, I'm not sure he'd get that totally right. Um, oh, okay. so anyhow, we have a date that we can work with. What other records? Well, Aurelia never naturalized. 
Nat U.S. naturalization records, especially starting 1906 and later when naturalization became federalized to the process and standardized, we usually can get that question. Where were they born? Yeah. But Aurelia never naturalized, never began the process. Okay. So census, no help, U.S. vital records, naturalization, there isn't one. Mm -hmm. But when a family comes from Mexico, whether they were from Mexico or oh, used it as the, the point of entry, Mexican border crossing records into the U.S. can often give us information to answer this kind of question. This is uh, my second great grandma, Aurelia's short form border crossing card. Now the United States, the federal government did not start keeping um, tabs of who crossed at the Mexican border and keeping records really until about 1906. Okay. Um, 1906. Some ports of entry, they're called land ports. Think of seaports. We're, we're often used to thinking about that. They use the same terminology. But it was about 1906, 1906 to 1908. Um, so they had to have crossed after that point. This is Aurelia. She crossed in 1919. Now the red arrow up top is, it gives her name. The obituary and death certificate identified her as Aurelia Nieto, Mrs. Um, Nieto, her married surname using the U.S. custom. So when you, once you start moving back you to another place, it doesn't matter if it's a different region of the country, we need to spend time learning about social conventions okay. for different cultures and places. Mm -hmm. And in Mexico and in the Spanish-speaking world, um, women do not uh, traditionally do not take their husband's surname. They okay. keep their surname. So we would have been looking for her as Aurelia Nieto and I missed her okay. because when I started looking for these records, they weren't digitized. I was going to the National Archives. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't take the time to learn names. She's under Aurelia Compeyan, mm -hmm. which is the name in her surname, stated her family were the Compeyans. Highlighted in yellow, she says she's 55 years old. And Aurelia, as an adult, would have been the informant. She would have right. given this information to the border crossing agent. So if we do the math there, um, 55, that works out at this time to be born about 1864. So okay. we have a different potential uh, date of birth. Um, it doesn't ask this particular one, some cards do, they usually don't, uh, where she was born. Okay. It just says where she last lived in Mexico. But the red box, this is something we don't always find on these short cards. These are called manifest cards, like ship manifests. Okay. Um, they're manifest cards. And we have to pay attention to every bit of information. Um, I thought that was just government jargon. It's not. It, that refers to a, an accompanying record called okay. a manifest sheet. We're going to look at that one next. Not every short border card has one of these. So watch for the field. I missed this valuable record for years. Wow. Years because I didn't take the time to understand. Because of this, these numbers that yes, just seem I assume like that just was just there. government bureaucracy, yep. you know, stamping it in. No, it yep. tells me there's an accompanying record that I need to go find. And this is it. And it does give us more information. So we see her name again under what in the U.S. we would call her maiden name, Compeyan. She restates her age highlighted in yellow is 55. Now, oh. at the bottom half, they're highlighted in yellow. It asks her place of birth. Mm. This is the first record I ever found that identifies Aurelia's place of birth, a place called La Laguna in SLP, Mex. That's the abbreviation for the state of San Luis Potosí, Mexico. So key information that I missed wow. for years because I did not if take you the wouldn't time. Have Oh, if you would have yes. stopped right here, you wouldn't yeah. have never had I did. that. I did. And it took a, a good friend who works at Family Search, brought it to my attention when I shared it on social media. She said, you know, there's a longer record, don't you? 
you know, so we need to always pay attention, even if it looks like it's just government jargon, pay attention. Um, so that one gave us her place of birth. We know, according to Aurelia, that she believes she was born about 1864 and in a place called La Laguna. So we want to, we don't want to stop with one record, no, right? We need no. to corroborate. We need to look for more records. Okay, so let's move on to step three, yes. which is to then go ahead and identify records from the old, the old country. country. I'm a librarian, and I'm also a college instructor who teaches future librarians, so I love great reference tools. You know, I, I don't want to just teach you the information. I want to teach you the tools so you can keep learning. Yeah. Family Search Wiki for doing oh, Mexican, I oh, I love it too. And for <laughs> really for doing Mexican and Latin American and Spanish research, hands down the best reference source for learning what records exist, where can we find them? Are they online? Um, what's the coverage dates? Yes. All and are there any known gaps in the records? The um, that's really Yes. Same for African American. This yes. is so amazing. Like hands down, I don't. They do. I yeah. yeah. Anytime I'm searching a new locality, period. Yes. Even here I'm right in my there. own state, I hop yeah. on the wiki. Yeah. Um. So that is where I absolutely steer people towards starting to learn what's available for yes. their ancestral state in Mexico. Yep. And so let's, mm -hmm. let's take a look at those for Mexican research as well as for. For Latin America and Spain, there's really two sets of vital records that I call the bread and bread. Whoops, um, bread and butter. Bread and butter. <laughs> <records. laughs> bread and butter. Getting hung up there uh, because I'm getting essential. hungry. I, I was know. already hungry. Now I'm hungry. <laughs> um, these are essential record sets that are so rich in for genealogy. So let's take a look. At those, we've gone to the Family Search Wiki, learned where to find these records. This is an example of a civil registration. This is the federal government vital record system. Throughout Latin America, this started post independence. This all of Latin America was once part of colonial Spain. Um, but after independence are when the country started instituting civil registration. And this is like U.S. vital records. There's other countries that have civil registration. This is for Aurelia's youngest son who lived to adulthood, Juvenal. He happened to be the informant on her death certificate. This is from 1898. And I've highlighted in yellow um, these records. Whoo, these are so rich. Uh, civil registrations, particularly birth and marriage. These are births, marriages, and deaths. Births and marriages will usually identify three generations of family. Oh so, my God. Yes, my U.S. marriage certificate and birth me? certificate does not. It identifies my parents, but that's it. On these wow. records, we frequently have the grandparents, almost always the grandparents identified, but also not just the parents' names, the parents' ages, are they still living or deceased mm -hmm. at the time mm -hmm. and where they were from? Okay. So, and really so what, does this tell, what does this one so tell us? Here in yellow, it identifies Juvenal's parents, Refugio Nieto and Aurelia Compeon. Again, she's listed under what we call her married name. Yeah. You have to understand how names work in those old countries. And it says she's 26 years old. So we have a new possible estimated birth year for her. Um, okay. I don't know who this informant was. I have not okay. identified this informant, but we have another potential birth year. So we would want to pull these for all of her children yes. and start yes. compiling what they say about where, when or what age she was and where she was born. This one does not say where she's born, but Juvenal, it does tell us he was born and the family was living in Temescal. 
which is okay. where that home was. Okay. Um, so now we're going to look at the second, the earliest type of vital records in Mexico. Is this the in bread the or the butter or uh, both? Uh, well, <laughs> this is one, one or the other. We, we need bread to put the butter on. So let's call civil registrations butter. Um, this is bread. This is our foundation. Um, parish church records in Mexico are very old and very extant, much older than we'll find with their English colonial counterparts in what is now the United States. Um, but this is the parish, one of the parish marriage records for Aurelia and her husband or uh, Refugio, and I say one of, because in the Catholic Church still, marriage is a two-part process. First is the investigation with the parish priest to determine, could the two people marry according to canon law? If they could, if it was determined they could, then the marriage takes place. Well, the, the marriage ceremony records are generally much shorter and not as rich in information. Okay. This is part one. This is the investigation. Both pages are a single record, very rich in information. Um, in With the red arrow, I'm pointing to the piece about the bride. Mm -hmm. And we can see that on the right. Um, highlighted in yellow, it identifies her parent, or it identifies her parents in there. But in yellow, in it states that Aurelia was 18, 18 years old at this time. So we have yet another possible birth year here, 1865, but we're getting closer, closer. to when she was born. Yeah. Aurelia would have been present talking to the priest. Now, the record also gives us a place of birth. You have to understand what these records say in Spanish and highlighted also in yellow. It did state where she was from, originally from and where she lived. On this record, it states both as Temescal, the name of the rancho. So her border crossing manifest sheet said La Laguna. This one says she was born and a resident of Temescal. So we have a potent, we have a conflict here. We have a conflict. We have, we're, we're, we've got an older birth year. It actually matches with what Aurelia states on her border crossing, mm -hmm. but we have two locations here. So we keep looking for more records, keep and? working back in time. And this is her baptism record. So um, again, baptism records will identify the parents and often identify, not always, where the child or the person being baptized was born and their date of birth. This does not. Um, this one states that Aurelia was baptized on January 10th of 1864. It does not give a date of birth, but it says she was 10 days old. So if we do math, that's January 1st, yeah. 1864. Her U.S. death certificate said January 1st, but a later year. Yeah. Uh, this record does not tell us where specifically she was born. Often these do. This record identifies her parents and also highlighted in yellow, it says her parents were from La Laguna, yeah. the same place Aurelia stated yeah. on her border crossing manifest sheet. Yep. So, oh my goodness. So more you, info. How did your family feel about this baptism? Like, did well, they say, like, we're not going to believe that we're going with the newspaper article. Like, how it's, they don't. And, and so we have to we have to compile all of this. Right. We, yes. we build out our timeline. So um, we evaluate the, the document and then share we, it. We document. We have to document. I, I build these out in a chronology, a timeline, identifying who's the informant. Um, the when was the I record, love that. Right? You highlighted that multiple times. Yeah. It's not just about the information. It's, it's who exactly. gave the information. Her son, Juvenal, yeah. he wasn't around when his mother was born. Yeah. Um, the baptism, it would have been her, her padrinos, her godparents who knew the family closely, yeah. possibly her father. Um, yeah. That's the one most closely related. And that's it doesn't true. say she was born in La Laguna, 
But based on her manifest, and when we research her siblings mm -hmm. and where her parents live, more records, um, it seems pretty certain that she was born in La Laguna, but raised in Temesca. Okay. So they're very close. They're in the same, they were served by the same parish. They're in the same, what we call a county. Mm -hmm. Um. So we don't know with certainty. We don't but, know with certainty, but you have the research shows that 105 is inaccurate, right? That is correct. not correct. She lived to be 99. That we are And that's, a, that's impressive. That's, I mean, that's impressive. That's now, impressive. Now, when I shared this with my large extended family, who's very proud of this, oh. um, the, the elder members of the family were not happy with me. We're, we're often the bearer of bad news. Um, and, and this is how um, you share it. I love it. I do. I mean, I create video stories. I do blog posts. I do photo books. But my family, aside from the pandemic, every year has the big tamale making party around Christmas, very typical of Mexicans. And <laughs> my dad was raised by his immigrant grandmother, Aurelia, one of her daughters. And Aurelia lived with my dad and that grandmother. So dad's the one who learned how to cook all of Aurelia's dishes Ooh. and her daughters. So oh. my dad's the, my dad's the tamale guy. All right. Um, go dad with yeah. the tamale. And, and I've used this party. If you have these family get togethers, share the stories every year. I tell them what I've learned. That's new. It, um, and they're let not, them keep saying the old story. Yes. And you go to the kids and you say, that's not really true. Yes. And my <laughs> great aunt just turned 90 years old. We just celebrated. This is uh, this is uh, who married into the family, but okay. she knew Aurelia very well. Um, no, she does not believe me, and and we get into disagreements at the tamale party after a couple glasses of wine. <laughs> uh, and my mom always says, "Don't argue with don't. your tia." Um, <laughs> I don't. I don't bring it up. My great aunt <laughs> brings it up. They, they start with you. I figured as much because yes. they like to start trouble and get stuff all mixed up. Yes. I love this quick start. Let's go through so, the steps again. Yep. Dissecting an immigrant story. It doesn't have to be a Mexican immigrant story, nope. just an immigrant story. Step one, what do you want to know? You have to start with a question. Step two, you want to locate U.S. records. Start in this country, please. Step three, you want to use the Family Search Wiki to identify records from the old country. Then step four, go ahead and locate and analyze those records. Step five is then you want to document and share your findings with your family, whether they want to believe you or not. Let's bring back Jim. Colleen, that was fascinating. Thank you so, Thank you. so much. Let's do our question of the day. And let me see if I can remember. Oh, yes. The longest, what is the longest, and guys, seriously, we have two minutes, so you each get 30 seconds, the longest genealogy road trip you took ever. So let's let Jim, you haven't talked in a while. What's your longest genealogy road trip? Mine wasn't that long. It was a, it was a couple of weeks, and it's when I did back-to-back -back a trip to Salt Lake, uh, where I was actually leading a, a group. Uh, and then went straight from there to Ontario, California for F FGS uh, in uh, 2002, wow. I believe this was. And uh, yeah, it was it, it was away from home quite a while. Colleen? Um, mine was two and a half months, not continuous. It was two segments r right before the pandemic closures. October 2019, um, I took mom back to Ireland. Uh, we visited uh, our, the ancestral town where her great-grandparents lived and were married. Then we went to the port city where they caught the ships because they came separately. Um, yeah. They caught the ships that brought them to America. Oh, um, and then two and a half months later, my husband and I went for my 50th birthday weekend in December nice. to New York City. New York yes. City. Uh -huh. And um, I did not realize, I knew my ancestors had entered the port of New York, um, but we visited, we did the Statue of Liberty, Ellis Island. Um, and it was there that I realized they had entered at Castle Garden. Bad. You got to come down here, baby. Which Great still stands. <laughs> <laughs> which still stand and so visited that within two and a half months the two 
supports that change their Fantastic. life. Fantastic. Colleen, thank you so much for being on. Um, my longest trip, my luggage never got to Alabama. IGHR for like five, six years, never got to Alabama. Felt like the longest trip in the world. Everyone, thank you so much for watching Genealogy Quick Start. Take care. Thank you.